sound is at the heart of the cinematic experience. Having our briefs about what should this movie sound like. The sound of the entire film, everything should sound natural. The worm. The voice. Get off me! The ornithopters. This is a world built entirely from scratch. We all took an early go at what we thought the voice should sound like and presented various ideas to Denny. And most of those were just treatments of the voice of the actor, maybe putting a little reverb on them, maybe putting a little bass on them. But it didn't convey the sense of power and explosive force that someone using this voice on you would have. It wasn't until Mark came up with the suggestion that if we hear maybe an ancient voice and perhaps we hear a multitude of voices, then that gives that sense of tapping into some sort of ancestral well of knowledge. So that's when we started to experiment with a kind of impact, a base, a sub-bass layer that actually uses a trick that I, I learned from a dub reggae artist called Lee Scratch Perry, <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not. There's a technique of getting incredibly deep resonant basses where you literally just play the bass sound that you have as a source through a large subwoofer in a room and record that space. And you hear perhaps little rattles and you hear the space being affected. And it wasn't until later in the process that when Denis had been experimenting with Joe Walker in the editing room that they came up with the idea of slipping the sync of that sub bass element so that it could convey how proficient a user of the voice is so that when Paul is learning to use it, it's not quite in sync and he doesn't quite have the effect uh, that, he, that he wants. Give me a water. Almost until he finally gets it later on and it's perfectly in sync and it, it feels very powerful and weaponized. Tell me about this sound design for the ornithopters. Theo and I embarked on a, a very extensive experimentation process. And it started actually during production, Theo recorded a, a beat, some beetle wing flaps, right? That was our first presentation of something organic because it looks bug-like, it kind of looks like a dragonfly maybe. And where we would end up would be the wing flaps processed and cat purring, very, very close mic to cat purring so you get that. and then layered again with the sound of a, um, a canvas strap from a tent strung in a 140 mile an hour storm so that you'd hear the flapping, the rapid flapping of a very organic piece of material. And then engine sounds were made almost entirely of bugs, mostly of bees, beehives process to add some of that flutter to it. The engine is modulating along with the wings, so we would flutter at the same rate that the wings would flutter at. Every component of it is acoustic. That was a guiding principle for us. Well, talk to me about going out in the desert. I think one of the, I, I, I'm really curious about the approach to the sound design of Arrakis and the worms. I had an understanding of the sand on Arrakis that I've never had before, which is like to the worm, it's water, right? Mm. It's, it's the worm is swimming in the sand. How did you approach the, that from a sound perspective? Well, to start with, I don't know if this is a widely known thing, but sand dunes make a sound of their own. They, they groan as they shift and move in the wind. And to make that, we realized that sand dunes must be resonant bodies themselves, much in the way that a, 
a drum skin resonates when you touch it. So we knew that we had to go out to the desert and play. We hit the sand, we moved things around in the sand. And we took all types of microphones. We took the type of microphones that you can put underneath the sand. We took regular microphones and protected them as well and put those underneath the sand. We put hydrophones underneath and recorded those resonances from above and below. And we started to build vibrations in the sand from the real recordings that we made out in the desert. The huge discovery really was just how musical and otherworldly the sound of a real sand dune is. We're just glad that there weren't actually any sandworms on there. <laughs> the shield, it was something that I, I needed the, the boys to experiment. The first thing was a kind of a purring sound and it just, I, I played it to Denis and I think he was like, yes, this is interesting. You know, we'll work with this for a while. And it wasn't actually until an accident happened within the synthesizer that was processing using granular synthesis, an organic sound, a kind of a purring sound. And the synthesizer just started to go mad and make a kind of swarm of clicks. And instead of throwing it away, I thought we can try that and just I played it to Denny. And I remember hearing him go, that. <laughs> But then Denis also developed a whole other level of what the shield could do in terms of, for the story, we need to understand that the shield repels only fast blows. Cutting through it slowly, you can kill someone. So we needed to really develop the sound of what it sounds like to try and slice through it. And one of the ways that we drew attention to that was Denis' idea of having a, when we see Paul using it in the training, we hear an alarm go off. Ah, the slow blade penetrates the shield. When that idea was passed to VFX, and they started developing like a red flash when the shield is in danger. So not only was the sound able to develop and become enhanced over time, but those ideas go back through editorial with Denis to the VFX and the whole concept gets developed as, as, uh, as a whole. I love the idea that uh, all the sound of the movie has been designed by the, those gentlemen. Activate silence. Another beautiful thing that you did that very few dialogue mixers do, and that is when we're tight on the Baron, Ron is pushing chest frequencies and we feel close and we feel that chest resonance of a very large person. I give you my word, we will not harm them. But we're in a medium shot or a wide shot, you're playing with EQs and we're feeling that. I just love to play perspective, but keep intelligibility. That's my number one goal to everyone here, every word in the movie. But by doing that, you can really play with perspective and, and uh, power. We're enveloping you in this whole experience. If the Duke's son lives, now our trade is will live. Then my fear was, but what about if someone listened to it on a, on a, on a very low-tech device? So what, how do you approach designing the sound for the film, uh, understanding that some people are going to hear it on, you know, air buds on a phone? Yeah, that's the challenge is we do a lot of different formats, you know, versioning, like, you know, obviously foreign mixes, but also home theater and, and two track if it's what we call a low row now, it's just left only, right only. So when you're coming down to that, like you don't get surrounds, you don't get overheads, you don't get subwoofers, it's left and right. 
how do we make that deep of a sound come across on your headphones or your laptop or anything like that? So uh, I had to high pass taking out all the low end that's too deep that wouldn't even play on your headphones or your home theater. Take that out to gain more headroom. So otherwise it eats up all of you and you, your limiters are hitting it and it just goes away, it just folds. So if you take that out, raise up that element louder. And then I used a couple plugins to raise that fundamental of the low end up higher. So it's a higher note and that would translate into your headphones or your laptop. So it's a combination of three or four tricks to get that to play. When you make a science fiction movie in 2020, you, you're dealing with a lot of tropes, a lot of cliches. So to try to find something new, it, it takes time and experiments. Yeah, I was lucky to work with masters. 